Welcome to Let's Talk, a show about talking to kids about race and racism. I'm your host, Karen Tao. In this episode, I meet with Kristen and Blair, who are raising their two children, Ksenia, age six, and Dorian, age four. They talk about the importance of helping their kids think critically about their own race. So it's not about giving them the correct information and it sort of indoctrinating them. It's about helping them become critical thinkers so that they can engage in these issues and they can learn. And how they approach and manage the more uncomfortable age-appropriate conversations. What's age-appropriate for my white six-year-old? Maybe a, a, a black four-year-old has already had this conversation right. with his or her parents. We've had to be very proactive about um, our engagement in these issues, um, seeking out books and um, people on social media to follow and news articles and engaging in that way um, because I think it's important for us to be, be educated ourselves mm -hmm. before we go and try to talk with our kids mm -hmm. about this. Yeah, that's such an important point and I just want to highlight that around doing your own work um, by seeking out um, articles and books and social media that focus on issues about race. The first time I remember realizing that I was white was actually as a 19-year-old when I, I served a Latter-day Saint mission in Milwaukee mm -hmm. and predominantly black community. Mm -hmm. That was the first time when I was the minority. And the vertigo that I felt in that situation really stuck with me. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to understand that. And so that's one of the reasons why I've tried to listen to a lot of different voices, mm -hmm. know a lot of different people, uh, read a lot of different books. I want to go back to this, the word you use, vertigo, and that you had an impactful experience on your mission. Um, we can read books and we can watch movies, and I think that absolutely is a first step, especially for kids. This is their first um, introduction to a world outside their own. And at the same time, you know how powerful those face-to-face -face interactions are, those, um, re when you develop these authentic relationships, these genuine relationships with people who are not like you, that those are the critical moments that shift the way we think about race. From a very young age, both our kids have attended rallies and public demonstrations and all mm -hmm. sorts of things. And uh, we talk to them about why we're there, um, who are the, what are, what are we fighting for when we're there, um, who are we trying to be friends to and mm -hmm. advocates for when we're there or advocates with mm -hmm. when we're there. And um, my daughter, Ksenia, who's six years old, even several years ago, uh, n could at least tell you, we're here because we love our friends and everyone belongs mm -hmm. in this community. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, and that's a starting point. And yeah. from there, we have many, many more conversations to mm -hmm. have with her. But she was young when she started to understand that not everyone in our community mm -hmm. and in our country is treated fairly, and mm -hmm. that sometimes it's because of what they look like or where they come from. Mm -hmm. And she that offended that offended her that offended as a child. Her, yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it wasn't a hard thing to say. You should be offended by that. She understood that. We try, in, as a family, try to engage in volunteer opportunities mm -hmm. where our kids can be exposed to people. Um, from different countries, from different backgrounds. We mentored a refugee family. We spend some time at a Unitarian church where there's a woman um, in sanctuary there. She's seeking asylum, mm -hmm. uh, spending time with, with her children. And we try to be really broad about it because we don't want to associate race with s people who need help or something. Sure. You know, that's, that's not Absolutely. what it is. Mm -hmm. We're not rescuers either. Like mm -hmm. we're not going out, uh, you know. Uh, I've found so much enrichment and just fun and, and cool experiences mm -hmm. with people of all sorts of different right. backgrounds. And I want my kids to experience that. Mm -hmm. This is about um, really entering into communities that are not necessarily your own, developing trust, building relationship, and it sounds like it takes some time yeah. that you don't just sort of drop in, do an event, and leave and say, yay, we exposed our kids. Mm -hmm. um, that, that, that this is a conscious decision that you make as parents to um, recognize kind of what their world is on an everyday and how do you expose them to more. Yeah, and I feel yeah. like the more comfortable we are as parents mm -hmm. with, with that, then the easier it is to do that with our kids. Mm -hmm. and, and the more interesting it is. It, it does require time, but it doesn't feel burdensome. It's not a job, it's not, I don't feel like we're checking something off a list. Mm -hmm. It's actually what we like, like mm -hmm. what we want to do. Sure. Why is it important for white children or your children 
to recognize that they are not the center. Mm -hmm. Why is that important? They need to know that what they experience here is not what they're going to experience everywhere else. You know, they're one little part of the puzzle. It's an important part, mm -hmm. but it's not everything mm -hmm. that exists. Yeah, I want our children to understand, uh, and I, I don't take this the wrong way, but they need to understand that they're white. And, mm -hmm. the, and what I mean by that is, Racism I isn't just bad feelings one person has about someone else. Mm -hmm. It's a system, mm -hmm. and it has a history. Mm -hmm. And the more that our children can understand that and understand and own their whiteness, the more they will be willing to contribute to overcoming racism mm -hmm. as a systemic problem. Mm -hmm. I want them to be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. And by acknowledging their race and seeing their race as one piece of a much broader mm -hmm. puzzle, they can own that better, I right. think. Pretending that race doesn't exist just perpetuates inequality. Right. right? And, and I don't mm -hmm. want that for my kids. And I it, don't want that for mm -hmm. other people. Mm -hmm. It perpetuates implicit bias. Yeah. It perpetuates a lot of inequity. It's, it's sort of this idea, um, you know, a fish in water doesn't know what. Yeah. In our current political climate, the term white and being white is much more loaded than ever, at least in the media and what we're seeing on television and hearing on the radio. So help me sort of understand, and maybe we can talk through, like what does it mean to be white now? I was thinking about that, and you can speak for yourself, but when I think about it uh, and my kids' identities, um, what I think about is that they have a lot of power in society, and they have a lot of privilege. For example, even the conversations that we have with them about race, um, we uh, like we can choose or choose not to engage yeah. in them. We, we don't have to tell them exactly how to behave in a grocery store in a certain way. We don't have way to tell them not to um, wear a hoodie, you yeah. know, mm -hmm. at night walking down the street. Yeah. They don't have to worry about some of the things that other children and, and their parents, if they're people of color, mm -hmm. have to worry about. Mm -hmm. And I want them to realize that. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want them to know there's, there's a responsibility that comes mm -hmm. with that. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, just by virtue of, of who your parents were when you were born and where you were born. Yeah, that fine line between guilt and responsibility. Um, you know, guilt as an emotion really immobilizes us. Mm -hmm. it, it makes us feel um, like, I don't know what I can do. I feel so awful, I feel so bad. And I think that that is part of the process of recognizing, recognizing one's own racial and skin privilege, is it probably does start a little bit with this idea of guilt. What are some actionable things yeah. that we can do? And what that can process we, continues. Yeah. And like it we're continues, still doing absolutely. We're still learning, and listening. It, mm -hmm. it, right, it's, it does, there is no end point. Um, this term multicultural competence often comes up where the word competence, you know, that people feel that there is an end point. I'm right. fully competent. A I know what arrival. I'm yeah. Yeah. A point of arrival. <laughs> and I think you're absolutely right. I think that this is a choice that we make every day um, to keep our ears open, to remain humble and open, and um, to be comfortable in the uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Occasionally we talk about news items with them okay. but as they get older and older that will become even more and more common sure. to engage with what's happening in the news what mm. happened to like Tamir Rice uh, when he shot mm -hmm. that's something Kristen talked to our daughter about mm -hmm. on a very basic level but as they get older mm -hmm. we're gonna engage with them more and more in stories in the news uh, yeah. and, and that's another avenue mm -hmm. where these conversations can happen mm -hmm. and not just to lecture the kids mm -hmm. to ask them questions mm -hmm. to let them critically reason about it. Exactly. That's what's important mm -hmm. because it's not about giving them the correct information and mm -hmm. sort of indoctrinating them. It's right. about helping them become critical thinkers so that they can engage in these mm -hmm. issues and they can learn them. And I agree yeah. with you that that, that guilt is mm -hmm. part of that process. Mm -hmm. I love that you're talking about just this idea of planting the seeds, starting to have these conversations early. You mentioned talking to your daughter about Tamir Rice. Um, and she's six, and so um, at different age levels, we have different ways that we, we talk about race and racism, mm -hmm. um, that we're not using big $5 words, um, that we're relating to them in a way that they can hear it. Mm -hmm. So what's an example of maybe questions that you ask Ksenia um, when you're talking about these really, really heart-wrenching, awful, painful things? What, how do you, how do you do that? I think the very first question I always ask her is, how do you feel mm -hmm. about that? Mm -hmm. um, 
and she'll and she'll tell me and, and often she'll ask me how I feel about it too mm -hmm. but first and foremost I want her to acknowledge how something makes her feel mm -hmm. um, because I want to make things age-appropriate but at the same time I always I also realize that age-appropriate is kind of very um, very subjective because mm -hmm. what's age appropriate for my white six-year-old mm -hmm. uh, maybe a, a, f a black four-year-old has already had this conversation mm -hmm. right. with his or her parents right. and so I think it's important for her to not be overburdened unnecessarily mm -hmm. but to also know um, that there you know there are kids that have different lives mm -hmm. than you do they have to worry about different things mm -hmm. than you do and so that night when we were talking about it I just asked her how it made her feel and I asked her um, how she thought that uh, Tamir's family and community felt. Mm -hmm. And um, and I asked her, you know, how can, I mean, I, she can't solve this problem, mm -hmm. but I asked what can we as a community do mm -hmm. to, to, to reach out mm -hmm. um, when these things happen. And kids often want to do something, even if it's like, I want to draw a picture, mm -hmm. I want to send a, a card or something, mm -hmm. like they might want to do something. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you have to really kind of pay attention to where they're at yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely, and know yeah. when to kind of like back off right. or Not give them space. Right, not to scare them mm -hmm. um, and just sort of instill so much fear that yeah. they don't know, um, that yeah. they don't feel like they can do anything. Yeah, yeah. They and they that, give you that's, signals yeah. when they're they, kind of ready. Yeah. They do. Like, okay. Yeah. yeah, and I know for me as a parent, talking about this stuff makes me emotional. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so there are times when I have to um, check in with myself and whether or not I can continue with the conversation um, because I'm feeling flooded or overwhelmed and so it's this bi-directional you know we're, we're having this together it's not just like you said I'm not here just to teach I'm here to really I want to know and have this um, conversation with my child so they know that I feel really sad mm -hmm. and I feel really hurt and hey, upset Karen, about it. I'm glad you said yeah. that uh, I, I think because uh, as a white person, mm -hmm. I, even a conversation itself is going to have a different heft to it. And the emotional toll mm -hmm. of the conversation is going to be different mm -hmm. for people of color than it is for white people. And, and so I, I'm, I'm really glad that you um, mm -hmm. said that. Right. But it's okay for our children to see us be emotional mm -hmm. or passionate about mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. there, have, there have absolutely been times when news stories have come up. Um, like I remember when Philando Castile was shot and I that really really struck me in a in a in a different way I think than a lot of different similar incidents. Yeah, this is a teacher. This is a person in a car with a child. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. And I it really really took me down one day mm -hmm. and uh, Ksenia saw me crying mm -hmm. and she wanted to come over and ask what was wrong, mm -hmm. and I was a little reticent to tell her because it's it's hard to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, but I told her in, in a very in a very simple way what had happened and we talked about it a little bit together. Mm -hmm. She sat with me in my pain. So mm -hmm. you know we she, talk about she's feelings learning, and we she, give labels yeah. for the feelings. And yeah. she's learning how to how to empathize and mm -hmm. I think that's really mm -hmm. important. I wanted to say that um, piggybacking on what both of you have said mm -hmm. If we're not having these conversations with our children, they're still learning about race and about all these intersectional ideas somewhere. Mm -hmm. they're, they're listening, they're watching, they're seeing from some other places. At school, with their friends, and on so, TV. And so they will fill in the gaps, in other words. We cannot just assume that, uh, that they're going to learn these things in healthy ways if we just teach them to, to be love good. Ev love everyone. Right. Yeah, to Gen be good people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. They will fill in the gaps. I've fall and pray to just getting on my soapbox <laughs> and doing the indoctrination yeah. thing. You're not exactly. in our family. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. you know, at the time my son was eight and um, that is prime time to test sort of authority. Yep. And he goes, well, I believe that <laughs> and I'm a part of your family. Yeah. <laughs> so are you saying I'm not a part of your family if I believe that? And mm, touche, <laughs> you know, I yes. was just, I was backed into a corner. So now I've, I've learned not to, to be too sort of fundamentalist mm -hmm, about mm -hmm. my, yeah. my beliefs, but to, keeping it open. Yeah, we yeah. have to leave them space and room yeah. to explore. Exactly. Um, and yeah. leave them room for evolution. We've evolved. Yeah, yeah definitely. I mean, <laughs> we're, we're not the same people we were 10 or 20 years yeah. ago um, in, in these, in, with these issues. And so we need to uh, allow them that same leeway that they will, they will mm -hmm. learn. They'll continue yeah. to learn. Most of these conversations that we have, we, we have conversations frequently mm -hmm. with regularity, but they're not 
particularly long. Mm. You know, our kids mm -hmm. are four and six. Mm -hmm. um, they could even be one or two minutes yeah. in length, mm -hmm. and that's typically enough. If Ksenia continues to talk about it and continues to ask mm -hmm. questions, then I'll go with it. Right. But if she wants to change the subject, then that's okay because I know it will come up again. Mm -hmm. This is not a one a one time one time situation. Si yes. Yeah. And you've already opened the door. They know that you are open to having conversations about um, these topics, and so they will come back. Mm -hmm. And I, I think you're absolutely right that these are never-ending sort of conversations, that they're lifelong things that we think about and will reflect upon. And the other piece that I'm hearing from both of you is humility, which is there's always more to learn. Mm -hmm. There's never an ending point, and that's a real powerful message that came across from both of you.